Please welcome Professor Kramer. Well, thank you, Nicole, for a wonderfully generous introduction. And I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, so I'm going to talk on the theme of the art of changing your mind, um, focusing on creative thinking and ways that we can develop our capacities for seeing the world in new ways. It's a topic that I found myself uh, immersed in as a function of you know, teaching grad students about ways of approaching their themes in new ways, approaching undergraduate teaching, um, and also in my own struggles to get my work done uh, as well. Um, I've been reading cognitive psychologists, sort of listening to podcasts, you know, doing everything I can to bring to bear expert wisdom as it's developing about creative thinking, mental processes, kind of how we can take the inherited worldviews that come to us and that we are barraged with and doing something new with them, challenging them, contesting them, bringing our own idiosyncratic visions of the world to bear. Now the expert, though, that I rely on most in my explorations about this topic isn't a psychological researcher, a learning specialist, or a talking head on public TV. Unlike these experts, this one actually lives in my house. In fact, on any given Saturday or Sunday morning, you are likely to find her slamming open my bedroom door around 7.15 a.m., jumping on my head and demanding chocolate chip waffles. Now I'm talking, of course, about my almost six-year-old daughter, Ava, who for me embodies creative thinking at, in many ways, its most developed. Now what do I mean here by creativity? Just to start with some basic principles. I don't mean Leonardo da Vinci. What I'm talking about is Robo Chicken. Robo Chicken is a drawing currently stuck to my refrigerator with a big magnet. What is he? He's a robot chicken uh, who delivers medications directly to your house on wheels so you don't have to wait in that long line at the pharmacy. Now, I can't help but speculate a little bit about what Robo Chicken says about my daughter Ava and the world that she inhabits, why this is what she imagines. So let's just leave that aside uh, for a moment. Um, I think it's safe to say that you know, Ava was proud of this drawing because she had never drew, drawn Robo Chicken before. And I think it's safe to say that Robo Chicken had not been drawn by anybody else before. So this, in my terms, is a seriously creative act in terms of both individual accomplishment and in terms of broader society. In the words of Einstein on the front of your programs today, uh, Ava here was involved in seeing some corner of the world anew. Now why talk about developing creativity? Because in this case, like many others, how we approach the question of how we think, how we approach the question of our capacities and how and whether we can shape those capacities actually determines in important ways how far we take those capacities in the first place. So the very ways that we imagine how our minds work, whether our minds can change, can instrumentally affect how and um, you know, whether we can actually change our minds, whether we can actually develop forms of creative thought. And in the case of creativity, I think we tend to approach it with some profoundly counterproductive and even anti-creative ways. So for example, we tend to think of creativity as something that's a feature that only certain kinds of people have, right? So creative is often used to attach to an individual. Oh, that's a creative type of person, right? We have the noun creatives, you know, for the creatives among us, right? As if there are some people that are not, right? So it becomes a noun that describes certain kinds of people but excludes others. We tend to think of it as an expression of fixed capacities that you're born with. And we tend to think of it as also involving isolation, the kind of image of the genius toiling away in their attic, right? All of these reflect highly individualist ways of thinking, which not surprisingly reflect the larger ideologies of the society, self-reliance, individualized competition, and the superiority of the market over other ways of organizing and imagining society. Now there are a lot of problems with this way of approaching creativity, as individual, as fixed, as inherent, as a feature of only some people. Um, for one, it tends to be enormously disabling uh, for large numbers of people, preventing them from tapping into sources of creativity and kinds of creativity that they actually possess. What if you strongly suspect that you are not a genius, 
right? Um, what if you don't have a usable attic uh, to retreat to? Now, the other problem with this approach is that it's undermined by a lot of what scientists and psychologists are finding out about how the mind actually works. Specifically, they're finding out that our mental capacities, including our capacities for creative thought, are much more malleable than we've ever thought. That through concerted effort and deliberate, sustained exercises, we can quite literally change our minds in profound ways, developing capacities we didn't know we have. Now, in popularized versions of this, this is the difference between a fixed mindset, that our capacities are limited to the ones that we were born with, and a growth mindset um, that suggests that one's capacities are dynamic and always in play, uh, and to a significant extent, that you can take them in the direction you want. Now, this brings me back to my daughter, Ava. Eva, I think, pretty much embodies the growth mindset. She goes where her questions lead her. Um, she's not worried that she may be heading down a blind alley. She doesn't limit herself because of who she thinks she is. And she doesn't limit herself, of course, uh, based on what her parents think she should be doing much of the time. Um, now, what a growth mindset looks like in practice around our house are day glow colored plastic lab equipment scattered in our sunroom, spilled out stuffed animals, uh, that she's enlisted in elaborate dramatic scenarios uh, that I inevitably prove unable to fully follow. Dada, no, you know, the hippo is Donald Trump, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, to me, a growth mindset looks like Ava's evolving self-description of what she wants to be when she grows up, which if I'm up to date, and this changes almost day to day, the current sequence is marine biologist, gymnast, doctor, teacher, fashion designer, right? Ambitious. Um, <laughs> now, of course, I'm not alone among adults trying to figure out creativity by looking at their kids for clues about how it works. Picasso, for example, famously said, quote, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. But what's Ava's secret? Today, I want to break it down based on my readings, some of my ideas about things I've encountered with my students and myself, and my observations of uh, this crazy inventor in my, midst, in my midst. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on three components that go into creative thinking, which are wildly at odds with the conventional wisdom uh, about inherent genius and fixed capacities. And the three features are curiosity, courage, and grit. It's these features, all of which are ones that we can cultivate, that ultimately determine how much of one's creative abilities you can truly tap into. So let's start with, with curiosity. Now we often naturally associate curiosity with creativity. And we don't think enough about what curiosity actually is and how it works. For one, we often tend to think of it as natural, often associated with kids rather than as something that we actually have to develop and work on and cultivate. But what we're learning about curiosity is that it's actually something like a muscle, a capacity that needs to be exercised and developed, and that can actually atrophy over time. So how do we go about doing this? First, I think we notice what we're curious about, and having recognized it, we register it and we respect it. When you come upon something you find fascinating, striking, alarming, delightful, you write it down in a notebook, a kind of cabinet of curiosities of your encounters with the world and the things that you register as significant and important. You don't ask why you're curious about that particular thing um, and not about others. We grown-ups like to judge and shame our curiosity and its limits. We think that what we're curious about tells us something about ourselves something that we may not want to know, or that we may not want others to find out. So I think a certain kind of protection of that cabinet of curiosities, understanding that this is about one's mapping of a kind of idiosyncratic, individualized kind of fingerprint, a kind of spiritual fingerprint that you mark down through your encounters with the world. And it's through those encounters that you actually figure out what's going on on the inside. 
you also feed curiosity. Curiosity doesn't exist in a vacuum. It only develops by providing it more and more material to work with all the time. For this reason, there's an absolutely necessary relationship between curiosity and education. Classrooms are where you get the material to answer the questions you have and to forge new questions that you didn't know you had. And importantly, it's also where authority figures like teachers and parents can validate that quest by helping you find your way toward the answers. So there's a profoundly social aspect to curiosity. Studies have shown, actually, that the encouragement of question asking by teachers or by parents is one of the most single decisive factors in shaping and cultivating curiosity. So it's other people giving you the permission and kind of validating your quest that actually encourages that muscle to develop, something that you then you know, see as legitimate, as exciting, as something that your, your social context wants you to do. And that itself can prove profoundly enabling and important in developing creative capacities. Curiosity also requires challenges. We tend to think of curiosity as a kind of easy, kind of roaming, outward searching energy, kind of effortless. But what we're learning suggests that to the contrary, curiosity likes to be challenged. Curiosity doesn't want the path of least resistance. It wants to solve puzzles. It wants to grapple with realities uh, that it can't quite make sense of yet. Psychologists have technical terms for this. The need for cognition as a basic human drive. The desire to close what's called an information gap between what we currently know and what uh, we are encountering for the first time the pursuit of what is called desirable difficulties uh, as a pleasurable activity. And I love that term, desirable difficulties, right? Things that we actually sort of take pleasure in grappling with, in challenging ourselves and our minds. Interestingly, there's speculation that the very ease of answering our questions on the internet by Googling them, right? Answers, or something we like to think of as answers, uh, are a couple of keystrokes away, may actually be diminishing our capacities for curiosity because it's just too easy, right? That you can just easily confirm, you know, whether with truth or with something other than truth, um, uh, the question that you're asking actually kind of makes it less exciting. And, and actually kind of that, to the extent that curiosity is driven by difficulty, uh, it, it can tend to underdevelop those capacities. Okay, so if curiosity is the first of my three components, of what goes into creativity. My second is courage. And here I'll define courage not as the absence of fear, but the will to act in the face of fear. Now for myself, I don't get the sense that Ava, for example, has much to worry about when it comes to, cur to courage. Um, she just kind of blunders into whatever she's curious about, heedless. And uh, so why is courage so important for creativity when it comes to adults? Well, because fear is, whether we like it or not, and whether we admit it or not, a profound part of most grown-ups' lives. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of embarrassing ourselves. We're afraid of asking fundamental questions that others may think of as obvious, which is why we call them dumb questions, when in fact they're often deep questions. We're also afraid of changing our minds. By the time we're adults, we've made, for better or for worse, certain fundamental commitments about who we are, about how the world works, and about how we and the world connect to each other. Commitments that we then build our entire lives around. Creative exploration raises the serious prospect that we may have to move the furniture around in these well-organized and well-appointed rooms that we've set up for ourselves. And that can be profoundly disturbing and threatening to our basic sense of self. If it's working right, creativity can make us vulnerable in ways that we don't want to be. Studies suggest that despite their need for cognition, human beings are willing to do almost anything to avoid changing their minds. It takes profound courage to unlearn what you've already learned. We're also afraid of confronting others. Seeing something in a way that most people don't around us and sharing that fact with them 
can be profoundly threatening to other people. And that, in turn, can be intensely frightening. We want approval. We want to belong somewhere. And we'll do almost anything to make sure that we don't alienate our communities, including silencing and shaming ourselves. So how do we cultivate courage in ourselves? Well, first I think we acknowledge that the fear is legitimate, that the stakes are high, that heading in new directions for oneself and perhaps for others involves uh, the possibilities of failure, of shame, of embarrassment. When we feel fearful at some new enterprise, we often profoundly uh, misread that fear through a kind of fixed mindset. If I'm scared, we say to ourselves, then I must just not be cut out for this. Right? I mu must not be gifted in the right ways. But just as easily, we can choose to approach that fear through a growth mindset as a kind of positive sign. Oh, I'm fearful because I'm moving closer and closer to a place of uncertainty. Right? I'm moving closer and closer to an existing edge of myself that I would like to ultimately move. We can turn once again in search of courage to other people. So just as in terms of curiosity, we need other people, we need parents, we need community, we need educators that legitimate our quest. So too with courage, we need other people. Like curiosity, courage is not a solitary matter. To be sure, projects need a certain kind of solitude to develop. Too much early exposure, and we can easily internalize what we think other people think about what we're doing. Uh, we can make our projects conform to what we think others will find safe and legitimate. So a certain amount of protection of our creativity, especially early on, can be important. But courage requires a community of supporters, people that stand with you as a self-creating individual, that value the exploratory enterprise itself, and that understand and respect the particular directions that you're heading in. Now here I think we need to be brutally honest with ourselves and acknowledge that there are often very few people in our lives that can deliver on all of this. And they're often not the people that we encounter on a daily basis. So it can be important, particularly in an early enterprise, to balance solitude and community by sharing very selectively um, on a kind of trial and error basis with people. Some of what is offered as support is not, when it actually comes down to it, actually support. Judgment, shame, and scorn can all be offered in highly encouraging tones. And I think we've all encouraged, you know, experienced kind of something that kind of has a support-like flavor, right? But it's actually not doing the work of support, right? And, and, and kind of keeping as far from that as possible is really important. And kind of but being very attuned to what actually counts as genuine support. Right? People that respect your quest, um, people that support you as an individual on that quest. Now when it comes to criticism, I think it's important to realize that certain kinds of criticism can actually constitute a form of support and a source of courage. And that's often that's at odds with the way we often approach these things, where we sort of say, look, I want you to support me, I don't want criticism. But I think that can be a little misguided. Criticism that takes the project seriously and that takes your effort in pursuing it seriously but has different ideas about execution, about process, about helping you to get to where you want to go can in fact be one of the deepest and most meaningful uh, kinds of support and perhaps paradoxically a place from which we can take courage. It means after all that you're being engaged with and your project is being engaged with and valued by somebody else, somebody who's going to take the time and energy and commitment to sit down with you and talk about ways they think you can do it better. At the same time, even as we gather a circle of support from what we hope is a growing circle, even if it's a relatively small one at first, it's important to keep this in balance with an insistence upon our own vision. To keep in mind that while we ask for encouragement and support, we are not asking for approval, permission, or forgiveness in taking the creative directions that we're taking. And anyone who insists upon granting you permission uh, or uh, 
um, uh, approval or forgiveness is not actually in your corner, despite their own sense of that. Um, all right, so creativity, as I'm depicting it, comes out of curiosity, it comes out of courage, and finally, grit. Now, by grit, I refer to what people used to call stick to drive, the energy to see things to their next stage and ultimately to their completion. This is related to courage, I think, but it's not identical. It kind of overlaps, but it's not the same thing. We need grit not because we encounter fear, but because we encounter difficulty. Things aren't as easy as they seemed. There are unforeseen obstacles in the path that we hadn't anticipated. These can easily derail both any specific creative enterprise and our creative impulses generally. And here, to be fair, while my daughter Ava embodies creativity in many respects for me, we're working on grit. Grit is something that she uh, still uh, uh, has some challenges with. She can tend to get annoyed and abandon projects uh, at, at first blush. So we, we need to kind of work on her throwing in the towel. Um, so what do we do to cultivate grit? Well, first, I think we have to make sense of the difficulties themselves in a constructive way. Again, it can be way too easy to turn friction into evidence that we're imposters, that maybe we aren't cut out for this particular task, that maybe the work itself isn't worth my doing or anybody doing. We can, once again, see the frustration as both legitimate and as a positive sign that we're on the right track that we're going where no one has gone before, perhaps not boldly going, but going nonetheless. Or at least we're going someplace that we have never gone before. Now the other key to cultivating grit is to separate the task at hand from our sense of who we are. A lot of our frustration isn't actually about the relative ease or difficulty of what we're trying to do. It's about our sense of ourselves and the way we turn hurdles into negative self-reflections. In other words, this frustration, this obstacle, this failure reveals to me my own inherent limitations. Maybe it confirms to me my, own, my, my deepest suspicions about my own limits as a human being. Maybe the fact that I'm interested in it in the first place tells me that I have misplaced priorities, etc. It's demoralizing to realize just how quickly and easily we can fuse our projects and ourselves. If you're like me, this comes easiest when the projects are flailing, but not, ironically, when they're succeeding, right? So when the project is succeeding, I don't say, this means I'm a great person, right? Uh, but when a project uh, collapses or implodes, I think this clearly says something about me, right? Now the challenge here is to rigorously separate yourself from your work. You aren't uh, doing it to make yourself a better person. You aren't doing it to explain or vindicate yourself to others or to yourself. You're doing it because you want to see it realized. The creation becomes the end goal and not the creator. So your loyalty is not to yourself. It's not to the surrounding community. Your loyalty is to the thing that you want to see exist in the world. If you hit a wall, it's not about you. It's about the wall, and it's about how you get over, around, or under it. Importantly, this makes the work itself, and even small increments of progress on the path, sources of energy and inspiration. The very fuel you need for grit to kind of power you through the difficult parts of the project. Now, to conclude, why engage in creative pursuits at all? Because the task of unearthing Recognizing and experiencing pleasure in who we are as individuals is, I'm pretty sure, as fundamental a human need as food, water, and air. I'm pretty sure Ava knows that deep in her bones, and I'm happy about that. And it's worth registering here, if only too briefly, that our society parcels out the resources and room to pursue self-creation in deeply unfair and even violently unequal ways. If you don't have health insurance or affordable childcare, if you have to ride three slow, irregular buses to get to work, if you have to patch together two part-time jobs to survive, 
If you have to fight so society recognizes your right to love who you love. And if part of you has to worry that you might be randomly pulled over and perhaps even shot by a police officer because of how you look to them, then you are by definition creating yourself within extremely narrow constraints. It doesn't mean that you aren't being creative all the time, including your creativity in surviving these various obstacles. But it does mean that you are being denied a full space for self-creation that others are being given in abundance. So once again, this isn't just an individual effort. It's one that we are and should be engaged in in common. The struggle to become who you are and insist that others have the same space in which to do so can be demanding, frustrating, and even demoralizing, but I'm pretty sure there are few that are more worth waging. Thank you.